Good afternoon, everybody. Sorry, but we have to start on time uh, because we have one hour and it's an intense uh, debate. So I just want to tell you welcome to all of you and many, many thanks for all the wonderful panel of children who are present and online. And I want also to thank all the people who facilitate the organization of this intergenerational dialogue and mainly Norway, who is on the way, uh, Colombia, Thailand, and uh, our uh, sister agency, UNICEF, IOM, UNHCR, OHHR, and many thanks to all the NGOs who uh, facilitate the presence of children today. Yeah? And the list is long, Plan International, World Vision, Terre des Hommes, DCI, and Swiss Red Cross. So welcome really and i am not going to take a lot of time because the, today the discussion is led by children and you know the respondents are you know adults and the children will have three minutes and the adults will have only two minutes uh, and uh, i think it's really important to have this intergenerational dialogue and to avoid having parallel discussion with the children as Children on the move is a critical concern, and you know, the, due to the unprecedented scale of children moving worldwide due to war, due to climate crisis, due to food insecurity and many other things, and also facing many, many challenges like lack of protective measure. But my God, you are amazing, wonderful, you know, and overcoming your challenges and uh, very frankly, uh, Many thanks for your courage, many thanks for being here, and many thanks because you are the experts and you know uh, what is working and what is not working, and many things are not working well. So without further ado, I just want to start by a video. Uh, it's very short, two minutes, and you will be happy because it's a wonderful actress, uh, very beautiful, but very committed, Penelope Cruz because we did an advocacy uh, you know we start our advocacy with unicef iom OHHR, UNHCR, UNHCR, we and uh, ourselves uh, and unodc regarding the problem of investing and protecting children on the move in times of crisis is needed more than ever so i will uh, give uh, the floor to penelope Children must be protected everywhere and in all circumstances. Keeping all children safe from harm and promoting Put their your, well being uh, is and must be everybody's business. Uh, Shella, 17 years old from Peru. She is a wonderful advocate for children's rights and mainly children on the move. Many thanks for being here. We have um, Sofia, 15 years old from Ukraine living in uh, currently in Romania. Many thanks for being here. Bakari, 18 years old, living in Greece, coming uh, from Gambia, and many thanks for being here. Belal, 17 years old, from Afghanistan, living in Switzerland. And online, we have Sedra from Syria, who is currently living in Canada. So without fur further ado, Belal, I will give you the floor to deliver your remarks and ask a question and uh, the people who have to respond, it will be, sorry, I'm not going to pronounce all the name, the ambassador of uh, Norway and uh, OHHR, uh, complimented by OHHR. So Belal, you have the floor. Hello, hello everybody. I'm Belal from Afghanistan, as you know, so as a young guy who had a difficult, who, ha, who, ha, who has experience of difficult trips, I would like to ask this question that, is it possible during the war times, is it possible to establish laws that protect and defend the children? And is it, is it difficult to agree upon as a human being? That's all. Thank you. Thank you. The question. The, uh, the question you already. The question is no. If you can respond, you know it's addressed to Norway. Uh, 
Hello, so I'm uh, just beside you. I'm on, good. Um, good afternoon, good to see you. Um, and uh, and um, thank you for raising an important question. Um, you know, everyone here in this room are in different ways involved in making rules that cater to civilians and to children alike. And the problem is not that these rules are not there, but it is that they're not respected. And, uh, and uh, in conflict situations and in, 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 in war, certainly, uh, it is difficult to make sure that people adhere to the rules. And I, th I think we can see everywhere now uh, in Gaza, in, in Sudan, and many other conflicts that, you know, it seems to be a breakdown of this norms. People don't adhere to the rules. So, so that's very much why people at the UN, people like me, everyone here, I think, is trying to find ways to, to change that and to say to states that, you know, you need to uh, live up to your obligations. And if not, we will hold you accountable. But then I, I hear, you know, this is the kind of language that we use uh, in the UN. And you will ask me probably, well, what's the reality in all of this? Right? And for you coming from Afghanistan, uh, I mean, I only know too well how hard that has been for the longest time and, and how the international community has essentially failed to, to, to put in place uh, good conditions there and, and, and opportunities for people like you to pursue the future and, and, and your dreams and to, to, to contribute to your country like I'm sure you wanted to. So, so um, it is certainly not easy, but uh, what I can promise you is that, you know, uh, everyone here are engaged in one way or the other in trying to solidify these norms so that uh, civilians that are not parties to conflict should uh, be out of harm's way. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Compliment from OECHR. Thank you very much. Welcome to You're with us. My name is Gronia. I work for the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. And uh, the question that you've directed to us, it, it goes to the very heart of why the Office of Human Rights exists. So as the ambassador has said, it's not that the laws don't exist. The laws are there. The problem is the lack of respect for the laws and oftentimes the absolute impunity and lack of accountability consequences for those who break the laws. So you asked, is it possible to establish the laws? Is it difficult to agree upon them? The laws exist. We have international human rights law. We have international humanitarian law in times of war. And oftentimes in conflict, we will hear governments saying, well, it's tough times now, we're at war, so we have to forget about this right to education nonsense and this right to food nonsense because we have other priorities. No matter what the circumstances in conflict, human rights law cannot be just suspended or put aside or ignored. So the laws are there. The problem is implementing them. The laws are both international and national. So there's a role for international organizations like us working together with all the diplomats that come together in these type of places. There's also obligations at home by the government. Now you come from Afghanistan and I think you asking the question raises another complexity because we ask ourselves, what is the legitimacy of government? How serious are they about respecting the laws that they have made in their own country? And when we have situations of what we call in our jargon, de facto or 
maybe not fully re internationally recognized governments, such as is the situation actually with the Taliban, that creates another layer of complication. But we are here, as the ambassador said, to keep fighting, to listen to you, to hear the challenges you have as children, and to do what we are paid for in making sure that those laws are respected and that there are consequences when they are not. And without further ado, the floor is yours, Sofia. First of all, I'm grateful to be here and to be to be able to make difference for those children who have different difficult conditions to live. Now I'm going to talk about some gaps to protect children on the move. Children, children who left ho home because of the war haven't chosen this path. They are not guilty for that. Because of the war, kids lost everything they had, including their education and the things they could develop with. When children become refugees, they need a lot of support. Kids are missing a support package to develop themselves, to continue their education because countries don't always give these opportunities. When we arrived in Romania, we didn't have many options of where to go or leave. We got lucky that our friends invited us to their home, so we had housing temporarily. Many families don't have this chance, so they're forced to buy a flat or live in a hotel for a long time. No one knows when the world will stop and when they can come back and home and continue their life. People who are asked to give refugees shelter and housing don't see us as people who lost everything because of the war, but it's not right. We lost everything and we suffer from it. There are four things government can do to improve our protection. First, governments should improve children's education. It's an important part of our lives and we can't just stop living because of the war that came into our, our country. When children arrive in, other, in another country, the government should give many different options of where they can live, get food and clothes. Third, if children don't agree with how their rights are respected, the government should hear them talk about these issues because one of the most important child rights is to share our thoughts freely and our, and our right to be heard. And fourth, the government should organize events like this one so that people hear from refugees and children who experienced uh, leaving their homeland and coming to another country with nothing. After that, people will understand and be more welcoming. They will change the way they think about refugees. Children like me have an experience that not all children have had, but we are all children and we all have equal rights. Thank you. you make sure refugees children continue to be protected and access their rights and that no, this doesn't depend on short-term pack, packages. Uh, thank you, Sofia. Uh, in Colombia, we believe that uh, quarantining the rights of migrant children should not depend on the estimated length of stay nor should it be subject to the short-term legal packages. In Colombia, we consider that refugee children or, or migrant children should get a temporary permit as soon as they enter the country where they, where, where they with their parents or guardian or alone children also. And uh, also, uh, we consider that a temporary permit uh, should be granted that allows them to get access to education, health services and any other public services that they would require while his refugee status is resolved and uh, in any cases uh, no child doesn't matter his or her immigration status uh, must have uh, uh, no child doesn't matter of her stat immigration status uh, must have access to education health and protection so uh, I hope I can I can help to answer your question. Thank you. Thank you. Fia, thank you for your question and thanks for being so brave to be up here uh, with us. My my daughter, she's sixteen. I'm not sure she would be so confident as you are. Well done, really for for um, sharing with us some of your experiences and asking these important questions. Um, so. Let's start off with 
the, the symbolism of you being here asking those questions, not someone on your behalf. So I think that's the first thing to say is that children ha should have their own voices. Young people should be, uh, should be given the space to advocate for themselves and to pose the questions that they find most important to their situation, to the journey, to the uh, emotional and um, uh, uh, very life impacting uh, experiences that you've been through. Uh, so I think that's really important for us to hear that directly from you. Um, the first thing, of course, is that we have to have safety, safety, um, safety in a place that is safe, free from violence. But also, um, it's nice to hear that you were received in a host family, that the community was um, supportive to you and that they opened up their homes. We see this across the world happening and we have to acknowledge when that happens and not just uh, think about uh, the assistance that international organizations provide, but very much the communities where you're received. So um, I want to really um, acknowledge that kind of support that is often there, but not always. The other thing I wanted to mention is that there need to be legal procedures that are appropriate to children who are moving by themselves. Young people often um, uh, find themselves in a very, not only dangerous situation, but an unfamiliar, uh, a, a context that is designed for adults that isn't necessarily appropriate to children. Those people who are interviewing, whether they're judges or immigration officials or border officials need to be uh, properly trained to uh, receive families with children, but also children who are on the move by themselves. Um, I think that the, the, that child-friendly and youth-friendly communication has to be the basis around which we build um, our, our uh, reception capacities. But let's go back to that important part of you being part of the system, listening to your concerns and really responding to them uh, directly, not via intermediaries. Thank, Thank you. Zachary, it's your tour. I am okay. I am Bakari uh, Fati uh, from the Gambia. Um, I serve as a youth ambassador uh, for DC Igrish. I currently live in Greece in Athens. Uh, I will talk about um, administrative justice. I'll first go with uh, remarks and then follow by a question. Um, for first, uh, the administrative justice system is the first system, um, justice system, um, children on the move come in contact with. And I think um, institutions or government and head of uh, institutions, policymakers, should uh, look at children with a different lens. So to take off uh, the lens of uh, the position that they hold. First, take it off, uh, look at the children as a parent, put on the lens of a parent. And wh what do children need? We, we all know um, administrative justice system is like what we do, what parents do at home. When you provide a good shelter for your child, you provide a good education, you know, good education for, for, for your child as well. Go in, make sure, making sure, go into the extra mile to provide, to make sure um, his status is regularized. So, I mean, his legal stay and everything. These children will be at ease. Your children will be at ease and they will go to school. They will flourish and they become good members of society. So if you put on these lenses and we look at these children on the move with the same lenses to put our position on the side, I think is the best way that we can provide these children. We look at them as an investment. You know, we if if we provide them this basic stuff from the very best from from the very first beginning, a good shelter, um, I mean, a good education and everything, a guardianship, we we get them. Obviously, uh, the probability of these people growing up and being good, good, good members of society is definitely high. So we need to put on these lenses to look at children on the move, not to look at them as migrants or refugees or uh, because these are innocent people. If we put on these lenses. We provide this basic administrative um, care for them. The um, the future will be bright, and they can become uh, good members of society. It's like investing. And if we don't invest, if we don't provide this basic stuff for them, we look at them as migrants and refugees. Tomorrow, these people are growing up in Europe. They are growing up in America. They are in the same society with our own children, the people, the policymakers' children, and it's going to backfire. And if that happens, we don't want that. We are here to making sure we have a 
a better society. So we need to look at them as an investment. So my question is, how can states Im improve the implementation of child-friendly procedures for children on the move who come in contact with the justice system, particularly in uh, administrative justice and asylum procedures? Um, often youth entering the asylum system, they lack information. They don't know from where, where to start, where to end. And nobody's there to guide them. Most of them don't even have guardians. And they are stressed out. And then, so uh, they're stressed out uh, about the legal framework, the legal procedures. We are not see, look at, looking at them as children. We are looking at them as refugees and adults. So we put them on a strict asylum procedure, strict process, strict um, legal framework. They will be stressed out. So this is stopping them from uh, focusing on education. How are states and governments doing to improve uh, this child-friendly and, and procedure for children so they find at ease to, to go to school, to pursue their dreams and become good members of society? So my question is, what are states doing? To improve, to improve this child-friendly uh, environment for children. Thank you so much, Bakari. So um, I will give the floor to Mr. Alejandro uh, and uh, to be complimented by UNHCR, UNHCR one minute and UNICEF one minute. And if one state want to react, I will be happy to give uh, the floor. It's yours. Thank you so much. I, we, we believe that, that uh, child-friendly justice is uh, justice that is accessible, age appropriate, uh, that take, takes in consideration the age of children, is speedy, fast, effective, diligent, adapted, and focused on the needs of the children, the respecting the right of due process, respecting the right to participate and to understand the proceedings, and respecting the right to private and family life. So. In, in, in that sense, uh, um, independent of, of, of being with parents or alone, migration authorities should provide a temporary permit as soon as the refugee child enters the receiving country. And uh, in, in our case, uh, the asylum, uh, the refugee process procedures should be simplified in the case of children. Uh, the national authorities could us uh, advise if needed uh, also to international organizations as UNICR and the Committee of the Rights of the Child or the Special Reporter on Violence Against Children to get advice on how to improve legal provisions to always guarantee the superior interests of, of the children easily according to the child's age. And in, in cases when the, 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 the child, the mother is a refugee or a migrant, or, and the child is born in the receptor state nationality, laws should be flexible to protect um, the, the child from statelessness and recognize the child's right to identity. And finally, uh, it is important to, to support the host communities of migrant children so that they can integrate and lead as normal a life as possible in the schools and in daily life with other children. Very Two governments want to rear Norway, Thailand also. Very <laughs> I just wanted to come in very briefly to Bakari's question uh, to say that, of course, when uh, minors uh, arrive in our country unaccompanied, we make sure that they have an adult to help them and to, to, to represent them in the meeting with uh, judicial and asylum procedures and so on. And we also make sure that, you know, the, the, that process is catered to children, for instance, that, you know, they are asked questions and, and, and interviewed in a way that is possible for children to relate to. I also wanted to support your point on investment in youth just by saying that it's extremely important uh, throughout conflict and, and, and dif difficult situations that we continue to invest in education and in youth precisely because there will be a day when the war in Ukraine is over, when the, when the war in Syria is over, when, when things look better. And at that point in the post-conflict stage, who are then there to pick up the pieces and go forward? Of course, that is the young people. And if they are not educated throughout, I mean, um, that whole capital uh, is, is less. 
So I wanted to support you on that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bakari. Also, uh, on, on your question for Thailand, we, we all always believe that uh, children is different. They're not a small version of adults, so we have to treat them differently. And in Thailand, we have the schemes called alternative to child detention, where normally we find that uh, the children in Thailand, I mean the refugee children, uh, uh, migrant children, they would, uh, first their family would violate with the immigration law. And has been so they think that um, uh, children should not put uh, in the same uh, decision facility as, uh, because you still have uh, future to learn. So uh, this just have like uh, you enter into the country uh, illegally. So we should treat them differently, as we mentioned. So under the scheme, alternative to child detention, uh, children will not uh, put in the in the jail. You have uh, special facilities and treat you differently. So I think that it is the first step that uh, state should, should, should do to, to protect children. And I think that is a good start. Thank you. Thank you. One, one minute, one, one, one minute, very short. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much, Bakary, for, for this question. Um, maybe just very briefly to say that a child is remains, she is a child and is protected under international child rights law and international human rights law and remains a child. So, so the question of the legal status should never really come before that. Um, and also maybe another point is to emphasize the importance of, of means, but of course of, of trainings of the various law enforcement officials, people that interact with children um, at, at the point of entrance, but beyond, including, in fact, administrative judges and others. And that really means prioritizing as well legal representation for children who are on the moves, especially those that are um, not accompanied. And maybe a last point, which is to say that there's been a lot of discussions on education. Um, to enable education, especially for children that are on their own, we need to also be thinking of social protection and ensuring that the children that are on the move are, have access to these, so that there's not administrative cumbersome procedures that, in fact, do not let them have access to education. Thank you. Documentation, because when they have they are statelessness, they have no access to anything. So I turn to Shella. You have the floor. We have a translation uh, from Spanish. Uh, English and the French. Buenas tardes con todos los presentes. Es un gusto estar aquí en representación de los niños, niñas y adolescentes de Perú. Quiero contarles que en mi país eh, viven más de un millón de integrantes extranjeros y yo vengo de una, de una ciudad que he recibido a muchos de ellos. Niños que han migrado de su país obligados por la carencia de alimentos o por la falta de servicios básicos. Sin embargo, no son conscientes del por qué migraron. Tener que adaptarse a una nueva cultura es difícil a su edad, pero se vuelve más complicado cuando llegan y se dan cuenta que no son vistos ni tratados como los demás niños, enfrentando situaciones de discriminación y xenofobia. Hace un tiempo participé en un taller sobre los prejuicios, en el que conocí niños y niñas migrantes, Nos conectamos fácilmente y me contaron sobre sus experiencias al llegar al país. Siendo tan chiquitos, tuvieron que afrontar la reali una realidad que acababa con sus sueños, pues no tenían un hogar ni una adecuada alimentación, no podían ir a la escuela y les era difícil comunicarse con sus familiares que se quedaron en su país. Además, se sentían rechazados en el entorno en el cual se, en se encontraba. Está claro que eso va en contra de sus derechos. Eso me hizo reflexionar que así como ellos, yo también pude haber estado en esa situación, porque mi familia migró de la sierra a la costa peruana. Aunque tuvieron dificultades, la comunidad los apoyó y con mucho esfuerzo salieron adelante. En algún momento cualquiera de nosotros, como ya mencioné, podríamos estar en esa situación y sería muy lamentable y no deberíamos esperar a tener la necesidad de emigrar para recién reflexionar y ser más empáticos y solidarios. A donde vayamos, los estados y la sociedad deberían hacer valer nuestros derechos como niños, niñas y adolescentes, porque solo así podríamos hablar de una verdadera protección hacia nosotros. Y mi pregunta es, 
¿Cómo podemos asegurar que los niños migrantes no sean discriminados y tengan acceso a servicios de calidad, como educación y todos sus derechos fundamentales en los países que los acogen? Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, Shella. The question is for Thailand then to be complemented by IOM. Over to you, Ambassador. Thank you, Shella. Um, thank you for the questions. Uh, before, uh, we have uh, raised this issue also before the GIF, the Global Refugee Forum, to the High Commissioner on the Refugee as well. We said that uh, actually uh, refugee children, is also migrant children, is quite important because it's un unfortunately that they start their journey of life with uh, to be in the uh, detention center or something and because their family enter into the country uh, Ill Ill illegally. So we should provide them uh, the opportunity. This, the, their future is still long. It does not like, uh, they should not be uh, tarnished by the thing that they haven't uh, created. They just uh, come with the families. In Thailand, uh, we we provide uh, we we uphold the, the 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 things called education for all, where we provide uh, educations and also the healthcare services to 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 children and actually to all the the, the migrant uh, peoples uh, free of charge. I think that this is quite important. Education is a key fun, uh, key factor to to give uh, refugee and migrant children the better and brighter uh, futures. I can, I can give you uh, examples where um, when I was in Thailand with the Department of International Organization, we met the deputy head of the UN Habitat, which is he grown up in the camp in Thailand, and he has been adopted to, to Canada, or to Canada, I think, uh, Australia, and he studied, uh, yeah, and he come back to serve with the UN. So he uh, used to be the deputy director of the UN Habitat in Thailand. So I think that education is the key thing. So, but another thing which is quite important is that uh, to, to provide refugee children and migrant children to have the, the basic uh, services from the government, some people think that uh, the nationality is the key. So you ask for the nationality to provide nationality. But for Thailand, this is just uh, uh, we set aside this, we provide the service because we think that it's more important that they have to get nationality, but all the children in Thailand, they get the birth registration and they can access the service. But uh, because nationality in some country is quite sensitive, have to do it later. So we used to provide the basic service like education and health services to the migrants and uh, refugee children first. And I think that this uh, the, the key things. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, let me first start by letting you know how proud, how honored I am, we are all are to engage with you. You are very, very um, brave and outstanding young people who are speaking. So thank you very much for that. You pose a very significant question. I think you have answered half of it. Um, there is no basis for discriminating children based on their immigration status, their asylum status, or displacement, even before they leave their countries. In fact, there is probably even more reason to protect them or afford them more protection than other children. Our colleague from um, uh, Thailand and the ambassador from Norway said the laws are there. Uh, discrimination of children on this basis is not allowed, but the law is not respected all the time. Um, it is up to governments to respect this law, to enforce this law, um, and we are there in a supporting capacity. All of us that you see here, UN organizations, others, are there to support the governments to fulfill their obligations. And how do we do this? From time to time, we remind them of their obligations, from time to time, we pick up fights with them, but we don't dwell too, dwell too much on that. But mostly we work with them. Is it because they don't have capacity? Is it because they don't have resources? How can we support them? And you ask a very important question in that regard that can be used as a very good example. Children, education. When states are unable to provide 
education where there is a willingness, we step in to pay for more teachers, to build for schools, but most importantly, and um, uh, Najat mentioned this, documentation, legal identity. Because we know children cannot exercise their rights, particularly to education, if they do not have the necessary documentation. So uh, it's not something that we can do on our own. We need to work with governments, but it is also important to continue this kind of conversation that we are having with you today so everyone, not only us, everyone can hear your voice and understand what you're going through. Thank you once again. Now I give the floor to Cedra. Marhaba, Cedra. You are on board, you are listening to us. You have the floor. Thank you so much. I first want to say thank you for allowing me to be in this space, even online. And I first would like to introduce myself briefly to give you all an overview of why I'm qualified to answer the question of what's missing to enhance child protection for children on the move. Well, I'm originally from Syria and have experienced the civil war that broke out in my home country in 2011. Um, and I had to flee Syria with my family at the age of four years old and was on the move for around five years before finding stability in my current city of, or country of citizenship, Canada. I have faced so many unjust situations and was constantly in fear due to the violence that surrounded me. And these experiences of threat and near death are things I wish no other child would experience, but unfortunately, there are still millions of children going through things like this even today. And I'm currently a 16 year old youth advocate and co-founder of my own humanitarian organization, Elegant Art, that helps Syrian refugee children in camps. So from personal experience and from connecting with children on the move directly through online platforms, I can say that there are three main things I believe should be in place immediately to enhance the protection of children on the move. All of these three points have one thing in common, which is child perspective, something we often lack in decision making spaces where all are adults and we don't have that point of view um, in hand. And the first thing I'd like to bring all of your attention to is the emplacement of child-friendly procedures. Um, some of you touched upon this already, and I understand that legal procedures are to be settled in a certain way, but intimidating children with big questions that are beyond their comprehension um, or using violence is something that should never be done. When me and my family were making our escape out of Syria, we had to go through countless borders where soldiers stood armed and used violence, which caused me to have long-term fear of society. So number one, we need to have trained professionals handle, handle child-friendly legal procedures with children on the move, whether, whether they're seeking asylum or in the process of doing other things. And the second thing I believe is missing is the consideration of the psychological well-being of children on the move. Because of the fear and intimidation they, these children face, they're left traumatized without a way to heal. So we need to have accessible psychological support programs in place for children who need them. I recently connected with an eight-year-old girl in Syria who was on the move and had collapsed several times due to psychological stress because of all the traumatizing things she's seen. And as I talked to her, um, I, it was evident that she didn't understand why she practically lives in the hospital. She didn't know about psychological well-being or mental health. And that's the case for so many of these children. So number two, it's very important that we educate children on the move on these issues and provide the assistance they need. And thirdly, accessing education is a big one that is missing for the enhancement of ch child protection. A lot of the support directed to children on the move is focused around necessities like food and water, shelter, and such things. And although that's of great importance, I think we should distribute that focus on necessities and education. Um, as well, because from the interview I did with refugee children as well a month ago, every single one of the seven children I talked to said that they'd rather go to school than go back to their previous lives, which consisted mostly of very harsh work that is very unsuitable um, in different in industries, like even mechanical industries. So number one, to recap, having child-friendly procedures. Number two, providing psychological support. And number three, supporting the access of education to children on the move is what I believe will greatly enhance the protection for them. And this is really not just my voice, but the voices of the children like me. So I hope you hear us and I hope you consider our words important. Thank you so much. 
For my question, I'd like to ask, after I escaped from the Syrian war, I was not granted the safety I was promised. So when children claim asylum in a country, how can we ensure that these children are safe and able to report any instances of violence or abuse that they may experience? So firstly, I'd like to thank Cedra, Belal, Sofia, Bakri, Sheila. You're all so inspiring. And I really thank you for being with us today, sharing, or rather, sharing this space with us, being so brave, and speaking to us. And I am emphasizing, speaking to us. Please do continue to speak to us. Continue to share your experiences. You are the experts on your own lives. We need to know more. Even, even though we think we are the experts and we know everything, no, we don't know that as much as you know, because you are experiencing it. Dear Najat, thank you for creating this safe space. We need more of this. We need this inspiring space for us to work better, to be as brave as these young people here. We need to stand up. I've heard my colleagues here. I, one of the, I am one of those people that I am very frustrated. We have been speaking the same discourse for decades and decades. 35 years ago, nearly 35 years ago, the international community came together, everybody, each and every, except one country. We agreed on the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. And now we're seeing these horrendous situations all over the globe. I am from the Mediterranean, just 2,000 kilometers away from my home. There is this genocide going on. It's a war on children. How can we, as an international community, when we all have assigned to the UNCRC, keep on looking? And I don't know, just do, putting across resolutions and trying to find, I don't know, amends to this. I cannot find amends to this. How can we look at the faces of children when we know that children are being killed in, in real time and, and, and targeted and targeted? And this is not Gaza, only Gaza. It is going on in such a number of other countries. We need to stand up. So when children flee conflict and wars and claim asylum in any of our countries, we need to provide the right and safe avenues to report their experiences, to ensure their safety. This is so vital for their well-being. And we could hear our young people here speaking to us about this. We need to have in place specialized and harmonized child protection systems, formidable ones, strong ones, where, yes, I have heard my colleague from um, the, the Commissioner uh, Office for Human Rights. Um, yes, we need to, to have also the implementation and the enforcement in place as well, because it's useless having conventions and, and outlining what child protection should be all about. So we need specialized and harmonized child protection um, systems to ensure that children are supported with all the necessary psychosocial services, psychosocial services to address trauma, the necessary timely health services to safeguard their physical health, access to education, the, the, the issue of their status in the country, the necessary legal services together with transcultural mediators, to mention just a few. It is also important that asylum-seeking children have the essential safe spaces whereby they, whereby they can freely communicate their experiences and consents. It is a responsibility of all of our governments, of all of us, of all citizen, um, civil society organization, organizations to prioritize the protection of all children, includes, including asylum-seeking children, to ensure that their Human, human rights are safeguarded and upheld all through the asylum process. 
Well, the Malta Foundation for the Wellbeing of Society, which I founded and still chair, has embarked on a project to better understand the challenges in, in transit and recipient countries by conducting a child participation process where children have fled various types of violence, wars and traumas. This project entitled A Voice That Counts aims to support efforts for, en for enhanced standards of protection, hoping for a harmonized regional and global child pro protection system. Thank you, Najat. Thanks, Sadra. Um, and, and really, your, your question has two aspects. One is how do we keep children safe? And then the second one is that how and where can they find redress when, when they have not uh, been protected? On the first aspect, how can children be kept safe? It's extremely important that we think that the best safety is always at home. I mean, we should really just also in any case work to ensure that children do not have to really be on, on the move and that the, the, the states that have the responsibility over their children really keep them safe from conflict, from different forms of violence. But we know that then when children are on the move, they really are exposed to a whole host of, of risk of, of violence, um, whether they're on their own or whether they are with their families, there's the risk of family separation, of um, you know, violence, abuse, trafficking, um, and, and so we really need to make sure that children are kept there and there's a whole host of obligations on the part of the states through which they go. And then there is the, the state where they are received, where there's also a lot of issues that we've discussed as we were answering some of the other questions. On your other aspects, how to find redress, it's extremely important that children be duly informed to understand where and how they can find redress if they are victimized in any way, if they're exposed to violence. So that really pleads for what was mentioned, the need for child-friendly procedure, child-friendly information, child-friendly spaces, where they're also being kept um, very safe psychologically and physically as well, as, as you were mentioned, the importance of psychosocial um, support. So there's a lot of obligations, um, and it's great to then have you, Cedra, and all of you voice these concerns in your own ways. I mean, you are all speaking on behalf of others, but also speaking in, their own, in your own ways. And, and really, that's one of the lessons that we should take from this, which is any um, way of also keeping children safe and protected from violence is also about having every single child better able to express her or his own views, to be able to really just also voice their preferences in the way they are treated. So there's a lot of obligations um, incumbent on all of us, whether the UN, whether states in particular, to make sure that we not only listen to children, but really hear them. So thank you very much. I'm, I'm going to change the rule, you know, I'm used to. And um, I, I just want to give, you know, to the children, you know, if you have one strong, you know, action or key word that you will need to transmit to all these people, what will be, and after I will give to the adults really to react by one word, not a big, you know, we need to comply and so on. One word. So uh, I will start by Shella. Creo que es este difícil definir en una palabra, pero eh, considero que todos los niños somos iguales. Lo único que nos diferencia es que algunos podemos acceder a nuestros derechos y otros no. Pero ¿por qué? Necesitamos adultos que, hace, que aseguren que todos los niños, todos los niños, niños puedan eh, disfrutar de sus derechos. Muchas gracias. Like uh, she said, it's difficult to find one word to give because we have so much to say but, uh, due to a limited time. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yes. So I would say uh, break the gap because there is gap from every step of the way. Let's try to break the gap to invest in social service. It's the only way we can um, tackle this issue. If we break this gap, we invest in social services, we will have um, a good product of children. Um, it doesn't matter where you come from. When there's investment in social services, we will actually um, doing something that we will reap tomorrow. So I would say we break the gap in every step of the way. Thanks, yes. Okay. Thanks. Um, in fact, our world is the world of children. Old children, adult children, teen children, and little children. 
So older kids, you, all organizations and governments who can improve lives of smaller kids, please listen to us and support us. Thanks. It's on. I hope that we have a secure and peaceful life for our children. And I think it's much more, much more better to prevent to preventing them uh, from this experience that we had, that I had, because it's not easy. So, thanks. I think the one word that I would say is definitely amplifying, amplifying the voices of children like us or youth like us who are speaking on behalf of a very large generation or a very large population um, because we can only reach a certain limit, but it's up to all of you in the room to keep spreading the word and keep sharing what uh, we have to say. So definitely amplifying our voices is going to make a big difference. Okay, so for, for, for me, one word is now. I mean, uh, the best interest of the child, child protection, CRC application, or this thing, have to read now. Thank you. I yeah. <laughs> investment in children, I think, is the best investment we can make. Thank you. My Norwegian um, colleague has uh, taken one word which I wanted to use. Oh. So, protect, yes, 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 yes. Protect and invest in children, in all children, whoever they are and from wherever they might be coming from, as uh, Bakri said. And I will take the advice of Sedra that I will continue to the last bit of <laughs> my life to uh, amplify the voices of children. And where I can, I do whatever is tangible that is possible. Thank you. I will uh, subscribe the, the words of my, my colleagues. I, I will say that, uh, uh, of course, the time is now to protect the children because this is protect, to, protect, to protect now, because that's to protect our future. That's all. Thank you. Child rights will be the one word and the commitment to continue to make sure that we listen to children's perspectives. What came out very clearly is I think a call for the dignity of the child on the move. Um, and to do that, we have to invest. In, and I think strengthening systems is going to be important, but all aim towards restoring, preserving the dignity of children who are on the move. Great. Only one word. <clears throat> Solidaridad. Solidaridad. Yo tomo mi inspiración de Sheila de lo que ella hablaba y lo escuchábamos de cada uno de los voces de los jóvenes aquí hoy, de las redes que están creando para que ellos mismos ayuden a los niños que vean en peores situaciones que ellos a pesar de todo que han sufrido. Muchísimas gracias, Sheila. Solidaridad. Thank you. Um, yes. What to say now? I think indeed action is what we need now. We've heard, we listened, we need to amplify what you said, and then we need action. And we need uh, that from states first and foremost, all states, not just those that are here and that are speaking. And secondly, uh, you know, our support to those states, as you were saying, um, uh, we, we, we need to make sure that those actions are taken. Thanks. So I, uh, we
I don't know how we make it, but thanks to children, I just want... <laughs> chapeau. Chapeau. Many thanks to you. You know, you are my light in uh, my, all my life, and uh, many thanks for being here. And what is important, all of you committed, because it's easy to tell act no, but many are forgetting because after you are going to be behind your computer and behind drafting resolution, and we will forget children, so we will follow on it, and we will ensure, uh, really, that we'll continue. And just I want to tell you many thanks to you, and also to many children who are listening to this, uh, event from, uh, you know, you can be proud. You are the best, uh, to be very frank. You are the experts. And I am always, and, you know, admiring your capacity, your innovation, your survival intelligence, and your amazing, you know, dynamism, and also your sense of solidarity. And we have to stop seeing them as passive recipients of services, but as key actors of positive change. So I just want to tell to all of you many, many thanks. And sorry if I have been, you know, disturbing and pushing you. And we'll conclude by uh, just re reminding Children must be protected everywhere and in all circumstances. Keeping all children safe from harm and promoting their well-being is and must be everybody's business. The number of people forcibly displaced continues to rise. So does the number of children among them. We estimate that out of more than 100 million people that are refugees or internally displaced, children are about 41%. Armed conflict, political instability, climate change, coupled with the effects of the health and economic crisis, threaten children's rights, including their right to be protected from violence, exploitation, including trafficking. In crisis situations, national protection systems are under pressure as they try to scale up and address the diverse protection challenges facing children who have been forcibly displaced. Many of these displaced children remain invisible to national child protection systems or are caught in uh, bureaucratic nets of lengthy processes of uh, status determination. Worldwide, various crises are pushing children on the move. At every stage of the journey, a child on the move faces heightened exposure to crime and violence. This includes sexual exploitation, forced labor, child marriage, recruitment by criminal and armed groups, including terrorist groups and deprivation of liberty. Conflict situations greatly increase the risks of trafficking in persons. Children caught up in conflict, whether on the move or left behind, are particularly vulnerable to all forms of trafficking. Mitigating the risks of human trafficking requires prompt action to ensure that no child goes missing and no child is trafficked. Ensuring human rights protection and safety for all children on the move must be the highest priority. In times of conflict, children are entitled to special respect and protection. All parties, at all times, are obliged to keep children safe. Investment in national child protection systems that include displaced children rather than excluding them or creating separate services for them, has proven to be more sustainable and effective in the long term. And this must not be limited to the emergency response, but must cross over into longer term development assistance based on the inclusion of these refugee children, uh, irrespective of their status. It is crucial to work across sectors to address the causes of child protection risks, as no single sector can address the nature and scale of risks on its own. Solutions must be available for children and families on the move in order to rebuild their lives. That is why strengthening the role of the justice system as part of protection systems is a prerequisite for upholding child rights and ensuring accountability for violation of these rights. In line with our international, regional, and national obligations and commitments, we have a collective responsibility to prevent humanitarian crises from turning into 
human trafficking crises. We are accountable to children in all our responses, and children's views must be given due weight in all decisions that affect them. Let's be united in creating a world free from violence against children.